Your Creative Push, episode 148. Just kid yourself that you're just going to do five minutes before you know where you are. You've done a lot. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is John Dalton. John is from County Kerry in Ireland, and he has been a therapist, a carpenter, a scriptwriter, a trainer, a cameraman, a TV presenter, a driver, a factory worker, a photographer, and a laborer. But most notably now, he is a writer, a painter, and a podcaster. And John, first of all, just thank you so much for coming on the show today, brother. Yeah, thank you for having me on. It's uh, unusual to be on the other the other side of the microphone, as they say. <laughs> Yeah, I've done it a, a couple times myself, and it's a very strange experience. It's uh, it's a, it's like less pressure in a way, but more pressure in another way. It's <laughs> yeah. Could we maybe start with uh, talking about your, I guess your artistic career before we get into the podcasting? Um, maybe just tell us a little bit about how you got to the point you're at now with your with your painting. Um, okay. Well, I don't know how far you want me to go back, but you know, I talk to a lot of artists on my own podcast and it, you know, when I hear them sort of saying, oh yeah, I was, I was so good at, at drawing when I was three and my parents encouraged me. And then I, you know, went to art college and everything was great. And, you know, I completely did not have that experience. I wasn't very good at drawing. Um, my sister was kind of the, the art, artist in inverted commas in the family and kind of had a, a story really of being very fixated on if you can't draw that well then you're probably not an artist so like I was I ended up going into carpentry from from school uh, even though I, I did art in school and I, I did like the only honors subject that I did in in the leaving cert which is like the kind of main kind of exam when you leave school in Ireland um, anyway, I became a carpenter and, you know, I sort of came close to art uh, many times in my career. Like I, for, I worked in animation for 10 years, so I was surrounded by fantastic artists, which just kind of furthered this thing of like, oh, if you can't draw well, you're not an artist. And um, so I'd kind of look at these guys, you know, and they'd make a couple of gestures with a pencil and this thing would come to life. And, you know, and I'd, if I think about what I could do, it would just, it just didn't seem that good at all, you know? I worked as a craniosacral therapist for, for many years as well, like about 20 years. And, you know, I just sort of do it part time, but it was only really, it's only really recently that I've really got into it. And uh, I just started in a very kind of tentative way, went to a kind of a, a very classical kind of atelier drawing uh, class and sort of learned how to draw and bit by bit just eased myself into it. And uh, I, even now I kind of, I wouldn't say I have imposter syndrome, but I do kind of look over my shoulder and go, am I really like, you know, is, is this really good? I mean, I think what I do is good now, but it's still there, you know? So yeah, that's kind of how I, I got into it. I think the imposter syndrome is something that, that never goes away for anybody in any kind of creative uh, endeavor. It's just there. It's just something that, that never goes away. And it's almost like you have to embrace it and, and, and get used to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had the experience where I've talked to some artists and they, they're like, what's imposter syndrome? I've never heard of that. And I explained it to them. They go, no, no, I don't have that at all. <laughs> but I think they're the exception. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they do exist. Yeah, they just, no, everything I do is great. And yeah, I'm, it's all it's all good. <laughs> so. so with the carpentry, with the animation, with, with, with everything else that you've kind of all the different hats that you've worn. What, what was it then that finally gave you the, I don't know, like the final push to, to, <laughs> to do it, to, to actually say, okay, you know what? I'm going to make myself into an artist. It's hard to pinpoint anything, but it, and I didn't, it wasn't one kind of moment where I kind of, you know, woke up one day and went, that's it, you know, I'm going to do this thing. <laughs> um, it kind of happened very slowly uh, I suppose the most conscious uh, decision I made was not to uh, go into painting uh, full time. It was to go into writing full time. I had a very mm. successful craniosacral practice in Dublin, but and you know it's not like I had a very successful business, you know, and I was making loads of money or anything like that. Yeah, I was making money and all that kind of thing, but I was helping people, you know, with 
physical pain, you know, helping their their lives. So I I had a very strong incentive not to stop doing that. And yet, like, I had this very strong sense on the inside that I needed to stop doing that and focus on this book that I was writing at the time, Maya Maya Noises, the book that came out of it in the end. And it didn't make any sense, like, rationally, but I just could feel my sort of in my soul if you want to use that kind of word that I, that it was I had to do it you know so I closed my practice and I focused on on uh, writing that book then I kind of helped my wife out in her business for a while and it was kind of coming out of that that I kind of went into uh, the the painting more now around that time I, two of my family members died a young nephew and my sister now, it wasn't like I kind of went, oh, that's it, you know, life is short, I'm going to do it. It, it. Certainly not consciously, you know. But mm-hmm. um, when my sister got sick, my, my wife and I moved in with my mother because uh, she, you know, my father died year, years ago when I was very young. So she was kind of on her own with my sister with, you know, very serious kind of cancer. And it, we, we kind of knew it wasn't going to go well. So we moved in to kind of help her through that. And it was when I, when we were there, I just kind of... It just felt like it popped into my head. I think I'll go and do this um, Bach uh, course. And, you know, it sort of slowly kind of came from that. Then we moved to the country, you know, after my sister died and everything kind of settled down. Uh, We moved to the country and we sort of changed our lives. But it wasn't a very conscious kind of, that's it, I'm going to be an artist kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And first of all, I'm sorry for your losses. But thank you. Yeah. yeah, I I think what you said is so true. It's, you feel it in your soul. I think, uh, even if you have, you know, everything else in your life kind of set up to good to go money wise, you know, situationally, but you just have this for whatever reason, your, your brain, your heart, your soul, whatever it is, is just telling you, no, like this is what you're supposed to be doing to, to fully, uh, fulfill yourself. And I think it, it, it's easy well, I think it's hard to push that that voice away, but I think people get good at it. People get good at ignoring that um, and just being like, no, nope, logically, I'm supposed to keep going down the path that I've already set for myself. And I, But I think it's really important to at least give something to that voice, to even if it's just 15 minutes, an hour a day, just just kind of start. It's not like you have to dive in, you know, head first, but just teasing it a little bit almost and, and let it just letting it happen naturally kind of. Yeah, well, it was that book that kept waking me up at night, um, and that may not seem like a big deal, but for to practice craniosacral therapy, well, you, you know, it's a hands-on thing where you're tuning into the person's uh, body to, to feel these very subtle rhythms. So it's a, it is an effect like meditation. So having a bad night's sleep is was quite serious because you know to do it well you've kind of you you have to meditate to a, a level that's quite close to falling asleep so i was actually running the risk of falling asleep on top of the people i was working on which you know wouldn't have been very good at all um hmm. but yet like i'd you know i'd go to bed early and whatever and then i'd wake up in the middle of the night with this book kind of thing i have to write so the only way i could i could figure to work it was to do a bit of writing and then i'd be able to sleep and you know it would be all right so yeah it just really sort of pressed itself upon me and that just got worse and worse and worse until i stopped (laughs) (laughs) yeah you you do have to scratch that itch and yeah i guess sometimes it, it leads to a complete change of life but good for you honestly because you're um, I actually I haven't read your book, but your art is insane, dude. It's so good. So you are definitely while you might not have started out as an artist, you are definitely an artist now, man. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Oh, of course, man. Yeah, I've got I've got four books now. If you want to, <laughs> there's four of them all together. Well, I'm gonna check them out. Yeah, I'd written another one before that. I'd written two before that one, and then there was this one, and then I just had another one there in January. And what's the newest book about? Newest book is about, it's framed as a letter that you wrote to yourself before you were born to remind yourself about what's real and what isn't real in existence. And so it kind of picks apart existence and reality, uh, you know, to help you sort of see what is what is real for you. So it's written kind mm. of in the first person. So you're kind of reading it as if you'd written it to yourself, you know. And what inspired that? I suppose my own just personal observations of the one kind of thread that's run through pretty much my whole life has been kind of a spiritual inquiry into the bigger questions. Why am I here? What's what's it all about? What's real? What isn't real? 
And then I was very involved in this kind of on the spiritual path for a long time. And I was very kind of into getting enlightened, spiritually enlightened. And then I think it was 1996, I got enlightened. And then I was like, oh, okay, that's great. What do I do now kind of thing? And then, you know, it just sort of, it just kind of kept going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So I suppose it's, it was just a way of trying to convey the different things I, I was kind of seeing and sort of seeing how it's easy to kind of get caught up in what's apparently real but isn't when you really look at it um, and then forget about or overlook what isn't real. So, you know, kind of using the analogy of a cinema, if you like going to the cinema and, and getting fixated on what's on the screen instead of what's how you feel or what's being communicated, fixating on the characters on the screen and, oh, my God, that person's dying or this person's really hurting that person you know you wouldn't do that in a cinema you kind of go well it's just a film like you know calm down but what is Mm. is real is how you feel about it and the kind of feelings that it evokes in you and the the uh, deeper things that are being conveyed in it you know right which is i think the point of art really and and kind of creative pursuits is to be able to to tap into that you know that which matters that which you know actually is like you said important yeah well i mean like art is great and everything the whole and life is great and existence is great but it all disappears every night which you know is one of the things that kind of go into in that book like every night it it, it all disappears when and you can kind of say well going to sleep is a little bit like a is a little bit like death you know because you dream and then you you know you like you you lie down and then you start thinking and then you start dreaming and then then you just disappear. The very thing that we're all kind of terrified about, about death, happens every night. And yet we kind of wake up out of it every morning and think, and don't even think about it, you know. Um, so in the same way, the most beautiful art that you make is going to, it's going to disappear um, in your own experience, like in the most important way that something is important to you, like it, that's going to disappear. The idea of it living on beyond, beyond you is just that. It's just an idea. But for you it's just going to disappear but the place that it comes from that you make it from that that's what goes on as far as i can see you know yeah i think yeah you you nailed it and and sleep is one of the <laughs> like you said it's uh, it's one of the things i th- i think about outer space all the time and i think about <laughs> sleep all the time and i think about time all the time like i i think they're very psychedelic things that we just exist within like but we don't Like, I'm always like, why isn't everybody staring up at the stars and just wondering what the hell is going on? Like, what are we doing here? What is going on? Same goes for sleep. It's like every day we just check out and, you know, pretty much every living thing does, you know, check out for a certain amount of time. And it's like, what are we doing? Like, what is that? Is it paying for for our time here? Is it like our our dues, our taxes that we pay uh to be a, a living creature. Um and it's just so mysterious and, and you're right, it's like it all disappears. Yeah, well my sense of it is, and I don't know this, but my sense is that you go into sleep and you like I in the my book, The Gentle Snap, I kind of talk about that um that where you, that we go somewhere. That we go somewhere when we sleep and that our real life is actually happening wherever we go. And, mm. and one of the ways you kind of know is because you long to go there. You know, like we kind of go, oh, I'm so tired. I want to go to sleep. And we kind of almost, if we're tired, we kind of almost fantasize about getting into bed and, and what, like, and disappearing. <laughs> so right. we go somewhere. And then wherever it is that we go, we're refreshed by it because we wake up in the morning. Now, I know you can kind of go into the biological, all that kind of stuff, but just personal experience, your own personal experience. When you wake up and you've had a good night's sleep, you're just totally refreshed. So I think we go into wherever it is we go and we go into it and we remember it when we're there. But it's a bit like those doors in restaurants. You know, you've got an indoor and an outdoor into the kitchen, you know. Um, and when you go in, you you remember everything but on the way out as you're coming back into existence you forget everything so you can't remember mm. all that goes on there and i don't think you're supposed to um because it would be like now in the end of a movie you, you know bef- going into it it's not as much it's not as much fun you know you don't enjoy it so much right and um, so we come out and we we uh, forget it all and we continue on and we we don't even really question where we've been you know but something has been refreshed in us you know how about astral projection or anything like that? Are you into that at all? 
No, no. Well, no, all of that, like the, well, I kind of go into this as well. Like if you think of it like, and you can get a sense of it in, in meditation, that you're kind of dropping down through different layers. So you're thinking, then you're, your thinking becomes exaggerated, you know, you're sort of, you can fly and you can pass through walls. That'd be kind of like dream, you're passing through dreaming. Mm -hmm. And then there's a layer below that that's like more psychic, paranormal, even more fantastic. You know, you, you have those dreams where you are surrounded by people that you know and you look in the mirror and it's not your face and, you know, you, you sort of know where you are but you, you've never met any of these people before. And then you drop through that and then it's into this dark, mysterious dreamless sleep mm. thing you know so i think that space down the very bottom that's the most real um, mm -hmm. and the rest is not as real and then you know reality consciousness like where we're chatting here this is the least kind of real you know but uh, it's very easy to kind of go to start that descent in towards the mystery and then get sidetracked into the wonderful different <laughs> realms that you kind of pass through and get lost in there. Um, so no, I just kind of, I'm much more focused on just going straight, straight down into the mystery. Interesting. And everything else is, is true. The thing, I think the thing about the psychic world that most people don't really get, like get in their bones, is that it's all true. And I think if you knew it was all true, you wouldn't focus on it because it's, um, it, you know, you can't just have the fairies and the good guides and the, you know, the nice spirit. You can't, it, it's a package deal. You get both sides. So you're better off to, I kind of view it like a rough neighborhood. You just kind of, I just keep, keep going through it <laughs> until I get where I want to go, you know, just into the mystery. Lock the doors and get to where you got to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So then what's your take on dreams then? And like, also, do you take what you get in your dreams to, to into your art? Yeah. Well, I, what I'm starting to with my art now is when I was practicing and treating people, you know, in craniosacral, because it's at that kind of meditative level, you know, I, used to, I used to see a lot of things and the way different things would resolve themselves would represent themselves to me visually. So I'd see things in my mind as I was working. So I'm just start, I'm starting to get into more uh, painting, painting that, you know. Very cool. So, so not so much dreams as such. I mean, like, dreams are, are fine. It's just another way of kind of talking to yourself and getting your attention about things. And, you know, as like I was saying, you can have very prophetic dreams and you can have amazing things happen. And that's great. And as I say, if you know it's all true, then you're not kind of like, oh, my God, I had an amazing dream. Because it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's that's fine. <laughs> it's, just right. as, it's just as amazing as the sunset and the, you know, the beauty that you see around you, you know. Yeah, and the, my wife and I always joke about this because we always will wake up and we'll tell each other like what we just dreamed. And when you come out of that state where it's like where you you were just there, you know, <laughs> where it was so important to you and so epic, and then you start telling it, and it's just like, yeah. what are you talking about? <laughs> That's the <laughs> stupidest dream I've ever heard of, and you just wasted a minute of my life. <laughs> but it happens both ways. But it's so interesting how it, it can be so profound to you at the moment, but then yeah, just yeah. so so senseless and and yeah, no yeah, point no. of it we did the same i did the same so, did you <laughs> did you dream you know yeah yeah it's nice all right well let, let's get into the podcast because uh, i think you have a wonderful podcast it's called gently does it and uh thank you yeah and for anybody that likes this podcast you'll definitely like that as well and i highly suggest you subscribe but um talk a little bit about how you got into that and uh what you attempt to do with uh, all your interviews uh, well, how it started, I, I had a podcast in 2007 for for um, another, a book I'd written, the Why Do We Get, Why Do we get Sick, Why Do We Get Better book, and um, that kind of ran its course, and just podcasting, the, kind of the shine went off it, and everybody, you know, stopped doing them, and me included. Uh, mm -hmm. So when I wrote uh, Maya Noise, uh, that book that I was talking about earlier on, came into my mind, yeah, I think I'd do a podcast for that. So I did a kind of video podcast, and it was really just a kind of a, a, an elaboration on some of the themes that I covered in uh, May and Noise. I think I did about 12 podcasts, and I was kind of, and this is just all me, just kind of piece to camera in different, different places, you know, I'm sort of driving around and, you know, different in different situations. I pretty much had said everything that I wanted to say, and I was painting and listening to other podcasts and listening to, you know, and kind of seeing that podcasts were making a resurgence and people were 
uh, chatting with other people on podcasts. And so I'm sort of in my studio most of the time on my own. I thought, well, that'd be nice to talk to people. So when I started it originally, I thought, well, I'll, I'll talk about spirituality and I'll talk about health and I'll talk about art because those are the things I'm interested in. And just just the way it it evolved, the spiritual people, when I started to really get into, you know, talk, thinking about, well, will I talk to that person? I'd end up just getting the shits with them and kind of go, oh, no, I just, I'd end up arguing with them the whole time because they're way off, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I don't want to talk to that person. So I, I found it very hard to find anybody that I wanted to talk to in spiritual. <laughs> um, I, the health people, I was quite happy to talk to them, but they just seemed really busy and it just never seemed to happen. You know, I got a few of them, a few people to talk to, but it never really worked out. So the beginning couple of episodes, I did talk to a, a mixture of people, like people that I was interested in. Like I had a young uh, 19-year-old girl, uh, Ashley uh, Young, who um, was giving away um, care packages to homeless people. She gave up her prom money to do it. So I was just came across her story. I thought, I'd, I'd like to talk to her, you know. And I talked That's to cool. Donnie McLaughlin, who, who's, who's, um, who funded the uh, Post Growth Institute, which is about economic, you know, what to do after we get beyond this kind of fixation on growth economics. And that was, I found that interesting. So I wanted to talk to him and so on. But bit by bit, it just sort of veered more and more and more towards artists. And now it's just exclusively artists. So I've just kind of gone from one artist to another. And really it just comes down to who, whose work I like. Uh, it's, it's a very personal <laughs> kind of curation, if you like, because I can't, in all honesty, talk to, it's not that I can't talk to them, but I can't, I wouldn't have them, somebody on the podcast whose who's work I didn't think was great uh, because I'd mm. just be bullshitting, uh, kind of pretending that I did. Um, and also, because I'm interested in them and what they're doing, I, I, my, you know, I know there's a kind of an authenticity to my questions and my, my curiosity about, about what they're up to, you know. Um, so really what I aim for with the podcast, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier on, because I kind of did that whole spiritual journey thing, and I kind of encountered a couple of gurus along the way, and I kind of, I know what that dynamic was like. I kind of, I'm, I'm averse in a way to standing and standing up in front of people generally, and kind of this kind of idea that is in our culture of the way we idealize people, and we you know, we make celebrities and we kind of go, there's a big space then for people to go, well, they're having a much better life than I am and they're much better people than I am and all this kind of thing. You know, because even when I used to teach craniosacral therapy, you know, I'd kind of say at the beginning, you know, I've just got a lot more experience than you, but, you know, you can learn how to do this as well. And it wouldn't matter what, how many times I said that, people would still kind of project this thing of like, oh, no, you're special, you're better you're, you know, a better person than I am kind of thing. And I'll never do this. So just there's a huge space for disempowerment there. So one of the things I like about podcasts is that really there's only three people involved in a podcast. There's me and there's you and you and I are mm -hmm. having the conversation. And then there's one other person listening. I mean, mm -hmm. we can kind of go on and talk about, no, 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 there's thousands of people listening, but there isn't mm -hmm. really like, there's only really three people involved in this experience right now. You, me and whoever's listening to it. And, and we're not really engaged with them. So there's something a bit real about that. Uh, and that's what I really like about podcasts. So my intention with my podcast was to just have a an, a, a conversation with, the, with whoever I was talking to. Uh, the sort of conversation that you might overhear in a, in a bar or coffee shop or something like just very interesting conversation where you, you know, cock your ear and kind of go, yeah, that's very interesting, that kind of thing. So that's kind of what I aim for with my podcast. Yeah, it, it it takes the the pressure off of you know being <laughs> like in no other world would this be able to happen except for our world where it's just the technology makes it easy to just connect with you from Ireland and just hop on Skype and well today we had a little technical difficulty so I had to restart my internet but <laughs> um, other than that I mean that's it you know you just hit record talk and then put it up there and and that you're right i think it's really important to have that that one listener not like imagining thousands of of listeners it's it's that one person that that ideal listener that you'd you'd want to to kind of be in that room with you to get something from the conversation that you're having and i really like what you said about you know kind of bridging the gap between like you know oh this person's special i one of the things i love about this podcast is i try to interview people that are just starting out on their journey and people that are way 
along on their journey and everybody still has these same things that that hold them back no matter how far they are in their journey and i think that's really inspiring because it shows that you know while they are pretty far in their journey they've had to go through a lot of the same things that you're about to go through and i think that that there's nothing more inspiring than that is to to put everybody kind of on the same uh playing field you know yeah, it's just it's just people really. Like I'm always surprised at at who says yes, like who who's willing to come on the podcast. Um, mm-hmm. It's got nothing to do with the you know the size they are, meaning you know how uh, in inverted commas uh, uh, successful they are. I, I actually don't know what <laughs> the criteria is. I've developed a kind of an intuition about it. I kind of know um, when when the time is right to ask somebody. But I've had people who are, there are no followers on Instagram, no Facebook presence, no career to speak of. And it's it's almost like getting, you know, Kanye West or something on the thing. You have to go through, you know, so many people and eventually they kind of go, no. <laughs> and then other people <laughs> who are very successful, you know, and I, and I just sort of send off the email thinking, well, I'm not going to get any response to that. And, you know, almost immediately I, got, I would get a response. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's do that. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's great. And as you say, everybody's, I nearly always ask uh, them, you know, what's their biggest challenge at the moment. And it's, uh, it's remarkable how level the playing field is, you know, because it doesn't matter where you are on your trajectory, you're still dealing with something. There's no insulation from that. For sure. Yeah. One, it always surprises me who says yes to, but I think that's, it makes the show so much better because it's like you, you know, I, I have an interest in what you're doing. I send you an email, um, inviting you to the show, telling you what it's about. And really the only people that say yes are the people that are like, okay, yeah, I could actually provide something or yes, this sounds like a great platform for me to be able to say how I feel about creativity or, or whatever, whatever it may be. I think that makes it a better show because it's, it's only people coming on that, that feel that they can provide value. Uh, and that's really important. And like you were saying about how, yeah, everybody has these, these same problems. It's, I think it's also helpful because then, you know, as, as a creative person about to pursue, about to dive in, about to start out, it's like, you know, that you're almost always going to have to deal with these things and just to, to kind of get used to them. Like we we're talking about. Yeah, well, I I think like from being a craniosacral therapist for that long, you have to like to to do that kind of work well. You have to get quite comfortable with uncertainty, and um, being uncertain, being comfortable with un- uncertainty means you you're always on the edge of uncertainty. So it doesn't matter how many people I've helped with back pain, the, the next person I might not be able to help. It never becomes like comfortable. You never get, you know, oh, well, I know what I'm doing here because you're, you're kind of working in this kind of soupy blackness the whole time. So that, I think that's helped <laughs> me blackness. a lot. <laughs> I think that's helped me a lot yeah. because, uh, you know, so when people say, you know, and I ask sort of seemingly very successful artists something and they say, oh, you know, I'm still dealing with uh, insecurity or uh, imposter syndrome, it's not that shocking, you know, it's just kind of like, you mm-hmm. know, well, everybody's, they're on the edge, you know, of it's all relative. They're on the, you know, that edge continues to move forward, um, but you still, it never goes away. Absolutely. What, what would you say is like the most important lesson that you've learned uh, from all your interviews and just like your whole podcasting journey? I think it's kind of run in parallel with my own growth as an artist. Um, like when I, uh, when I started the podcast, I think it was just, I just, the idea of interviewing artists had kind of started to kick around in my head. And somebody sent me, an Irish artist, um, Francis O'Toole, I think, uh, sent me a friend request. And when I accepted his friend request and I looked at his paintings, I, I felt physically ill. Uh, like I actually felt nauseous because I didn't realize people could <laughs> could paint like that nowadays. You know, you kind of look <laughs> back at the, the you know, the, the the old masters and go, yeah, well, they had some special thing. They knew how to do that then. But like I th- that opened me up to this whole world of like um, realist uh, painters and, and uh, classical painters that are working today. His skill level is just... <laughs> it's it's fantastic in one hand and it's depressing in the other hand you know because <laughs> it's just they're so good like um so i've had people on who've spent 12 years like training you know they've just mm-hmm. gone from one kind of training to another and 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 that on top of just a natural uh, ability you know so that has really 
Um, I mean, there's a thing, I think it's a business thing of like, you can tell, you can tell where you're going to be in five years by the books you read and the people you associate with. Mm, And mm -hmm. so I kind of, even though I live in, you know, a little house in the forest in the country, I associate with very high level, like because of the podcast, I associate with very high level, um, artists so i kind of have to you know put my own kind of issues <laughs> to one side and uh to to get in touch with them and then to hold a reasonable conversation with them and then you know whoever i'm going to talk to i do a lot of homework on them beforehand um so uh, you know i can ask them intelligent questions and useful questions and questions that you know the third person in the conversation will find interesting so in that homework that i have to do on the person i learn a lot I discover a lot because I didn't never went to art college or anything like that. So it's all, you know, it, it was, I mean, I know quite a bit more, I you know a lot more now than I did when I started doing the, the podcast for that reason. And then n- n- it's kind of gone that each person that I talk to, I generally will have something that will uh, help me. Uh, not, not consciously. It's not like they'll say, okay, now here's how you use this particular paint thing. It's more to do with the inner work involved in painting like i've started to talk to more and more abstract artists because i think i'm kind of going to do a bit of abstract art but i'm not really sure and again it hasn't been a planned thing i just happened to start talking talking to um artists that i uh, like who happen to do abstract art as well so kind of in that way um each one has kind of helped me in their own uh, particular way in my own growth you know and it continues on like that no, I think that that's one of the most important things too is like um being inspired by by the guests, being inspired finding some sort of inspiration and actually utilizing it too. And for a listener or for the host, I think it's really important. Yeah, well that's certainly my experience. But that is almost all the time we have. So in uh that light, maybe we can give somebody something to inspire them with the final push. And this is where I ask you to kind of reach to the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already inspired today and just give them your best advice and really push them to pursue their creative passions. All right. Yeah. (laughs) That always conjures up a very weird kind of mental image for me, you know, like, (laughs) hello, literally, (laughs) I'm right behind you. Uh, Poltergeist. um, (laughs) Yeah. Um, well, I suppose the like the things that I like I I'm terrible with willpower. I've got I, I a long time ago I discovered that, you know, willpower was just another way of beating myself up about things. So, for me, it's always been about tapping into what's true for me. And what's true for me is, you know, I kind of look around and and from a very early age, I was very aware of death. Like I don't mean in a macabre way, but kind of like uh, I'm going to die one day and is this, you know, what am I doing work? You know, cause I've, I've had lots of shit jobs, you know, and I've kind of gone, what, why, why am I, one day I'm going to be dead. Like, and I'll look back and, or whatever, you know, life will be over. And what am I doing this for? Like, you know, even though logically it's the thing to do, you know, it's eroding me. I can feel it eroding me. I think that is a very strong motivator for me of like, is this really a good expression of of who I am? And if not, then change it. I'll I'll do something to change it. I might be able to do something immediately, like drastically change it if I'm if it's a financial thing. But then the other thing is you can you can make transitions more sustainable by um getting rid of things that are not that important. Like, you know, I live in the country, my overheads are very low. So it's easy for me to to be an artist. I don't have like big city expenses. So by being a bit of a minimalist and focusing on what makes me happy, because really the big work of art for me is my life. Um, So it's not like I'm interested in being a super successful artist that, you know, has terrible relationships, uh, terrible health, just miserable. You know, that whole thing doesn't appeal to me at all. So all the time I'm monitoring my life to see, you know, is is it as sweet and is it as peaceful and is it an expression of me, uh, as much of an expression of me as I can make it to be. And I, I tweak it all day long. 
you know, and doing art and podcasts and writing and all the other things are a part of it. But then so is doing the dishes and, you know, making sure that, you know, I maintain the, the love with my wife and, you know, the people who are close to me and all those things. Those are just as important uh, to me and everything fits together uh, as best I can. So if you're feeling a bit stuck, there's a there's great power in just tricking yourself, <laughs> using, <laughs> using delusion to your advantage, and you can just sort of go, well, I'll just do a little bit. I'll just I'll just make one mark. I'll just write one word. I'll just just do one. I'll just start. I'll just start this little thing. And if you instead of kind of thinking in terms of the finished, I'm going to paint this big picture. I'm going to write this book. I'm going to write this symphony or whatever. It's going to go, well, I'm just going to do this little bit, you know, I'm probably not going to get it all done tonight, but I'll just do a little bit. And then, you know, I was just looking at an artist friend of mine thing recently and he, or the other day, and he was saying that, um, you, you really know you're in the flow when your third cup of tea has gone cold. And it's that kind of thing, you know, if you just start, just do, just kid yourself that you're just going to do five minutes, um, you know, before you know where you are, you've spent, you've, 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 you've done a lot, you know, um, so yes, that's what I would, what I would say. Yeah, I think that's beautiful advice to treat it, treat your life as your art. I think it's really important to do, and and the. Uh, a way to do that is to just take the pressure off when you're actually getting to the actual art, um, to the actual creative process. It's just taking that pressure off of the, the, the big masterpiece or the big symphony, like you said, and just enjoying the time that you have with it. And then just if, like you said, if it's not like delightful, then find a way to, to alter it. I think that's really good advice, man. Oh, thank you. Being happy, being happy. It's important, you know, <laughs> enjoying your life shit <laughs> what else is there it, right it's the it's the only thing that really matters so hopefully um whatever your creative passion is you're able to to incorporate it to make your life happy you know and if if, and if it's not <laughs> then cut it out you know it, it should it should be there to make you happy on a daily basis so yeah john thank you so much for for co- coming on the show man i really appreciate it oh my pleasure thanks for having me on of course and uh you can find John on his website, which is John Dalton, D A L T O N dot M E. Um, you can find everything there, his books, the podcast, which I highly recommend, uh, and his art. John, thanks again, man. Thank you. A big thank you to John for coming on the show. I don't think that there's a better outlook on life than that. It's treating your life as your art. It's not just finding ways to incorporate your art or your creativity into your life but finding ways to make your art and your creativity a part of your life, a part of your very essence. I think it's one of those profound things that that sounds great on paper. It's really hard to do, but once you can figure out a way to do that, figure out a way to live your life by that mentality, I think it will make your life that much more enriched. So definitely go check out Gently Does It, which is John's podcast. Check out his books. You can head to johndalton.me or head to our show notes page to find all the links we talked about yourcreativepush.com slash 148 that's all i've got for you today hopefully you're inspired to go and get your work done so go and get it done and we will be here for you on wednesday if you need the push again have a great and productive day i love you all and we will see you next time bye Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.